the Main People Podcast. Available everywhere. Click subscribe so you never miss an episode. Hey, I'm John Shannon. Welcome to the Main People Podcast. My first guest has been a friend for a few years and is a uh, police detective here in Southern Maine, unnamed town. Matt Yetten, welcome to the Main People Podcast. Thanks for having me. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, sex doll you almost killed uh, and about the uh, bag of rubber things that you found uh, and a number of interesting cases and your history as a police officer and all that is coming up. But first, tell us what you do as a detective for the unnamed Southern Maine town. So I'm I'm just assigned to the, to the criminal investigations division, and uh, the specialty I guess you could say is kind of doing cell phone crimes, um, if you will, social media things, um, extortion, and and so on with uh, private images, but also a general detective. So kind of anything that comes in and it's uh, my turn up on the docket, then I grab the case and, and run it from there. I have a quiz for you since you're starting as a uh, we're starting here uh, with a bang. Can you tell me, please, what a uh, what a ten fifteen means? Uh, that means that you are with somebody um, in close proximity. So you're going to talk about somebody, and the dispatcher might come over the air and say, "Hey, are you ten fifteen? Which means you're next to them, or you're in earshot of them, and they're going to give okay. you information that you don't necessarily want them to hear. What what if uh, what if there's a call for a ten fifty five? What is that, Matt? That's a crash, a traffic crash. Okay. Uh, and if uh, if there is a call for a um, uh, a ten forty four, what about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably don't have a lot of those That's calls. The, uh, well, uh, it used to be for what was considered uh, maybe somebody that was um, emotionally disturbed. I don't know what the politically okay. correct word for it anymore is, but that's the best <laughs> way I can work. describe it. That'll work. And the classic ten four. Are we drinking? Yeah, well, I no, well, this is, uh, yeah, well, I mean, a little bit. I mean, why not? Right. I'm, well, you're in the home bar. I'll start. That's right. You already started. Why don't you, uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit of how, about how this came to be. You have the most incredible home bar, uh, and not something you would expect. I'm sure every police, police officer doesn't have one of these in their basement, although I'm, I'm sure there've been some gatherings there. How'd this come yeah, to be? Well, like it's this? mostly in their desk drawers, I think, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, right. Uh, well, so it was it, during the pandemic. It, um, we kind of got tired of not being able to go anywhere. We we're sitting at home doing nothing. We we're in the middle of a basement project, finishing the basement. And a buddy of mine, who's also a cop, said, "You should build a bar." And I went, "That's a great idea." Okay. So uh, over a couple of drinks and some some uh, painters tape, we taped it out and just built it. And here it is. Wow, it's pretty great. Um, so as a uh, as a police detective, what sort of is the journey from Police academy to police detective. Well, depending the on the agency version. you're at, it, 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 yeah, it, it can be long. But um, you graduate from the academy, you spend a few years on the road, understand the job, understanding how the court system works, and then you just prove yourself through your investigations on how you put cases together and can explain the details. And then you wait for an opportunity and you and you try to get promoted. Can we just get to one of the good stories first? I know you have a lot of stories that you're willing to share, uh, and this is really great. Tell me about the time you almost shot that sex doll. So um, it, it's kind of, it's a great story. So you got to I got to take you back in time. I'm a rookie cop at the time, fresh out of the academy. I was um, I don't know 145 pounds at the time. Probably you know looked good, right? I had the squared away uniform, spot, polished boots, right? Everything by the book. And when you're on field training, you get assigned to a field training officer who teaches you the ropes. Well, this particular day when I signed on, my field training officer was out sick that day. So I had a, a senior guy that I was riding with and um, he wasn't necessarily as in shape as me. Um, he had like 30 years on, big belly, didn't care, gruff, you know? So uh, we get in the car and the first call that comes in is a, a young lady who lived in a triple decker. So if you're familiar with um, triple decker apartment buildings, there's yep. an apartment on each floor. And she calls and says, I, I went to the store. And I got home and my door was open and I think somebody might be inside. So we get there. And of course I'm all, you know, rookie cop, like, okay, here we go. That's what we're going to do. And he's just like smoking a butt, rolls his sleeves up. He's like, here we go. We get to this uh, uh, third floor apartment and we walk in and it was, it was really nice. It was very well put together. It smelled nice, which uh, we didn't really come across that often. And <laughs> everything had its spots. Right? Oh, it's that kind of neighborhood. 
Well, yeah, you know, it kind of smells like ammonia, I guess you could. Right? Uh, okay. Can oh. Let's, let's be real. It smells like pee. Um, <laughs> oh. I got a better joke for that, but I don't know if I can say it. But <laughs> um, I used to say it smelled like Bitterford on New Year's Day, broken dreams, and stale beer, but. <laughs> hey, I'm not going to get the complaints. It's fine. <laughs> and neither of us live so, in Bitterford. So, We're okay. That's right. So at any rate, uh, we get there and uh, we're checking everything. Everything looks fine. There's a bedroom. And so he's like, oh, hey, kid, we got to check the bedroom before we leave. And I'm like, all right. So we go in there and we open the door and it's bizarro world, something I've never seen in my entire life. So it had those skylights that come, come down over the, over the bed. And there's uh, whips and chains and like felt um, red wallpaper and wow. tripods and cameras and stacks of dvds of, of adult films that's what you used to watch it on back in the day was dvds um and cameras and like all this weird shit and i'm and I, so i'm like a brand new cop i have no idea what to do i'm like sweating i'm like so embarrassed right and there's these double doors that are um like french doors for a closet and yeah. so he's like hey we gotta check this before we leave he opens the door and as a door opens, sitting there upright is a full-sized, uh, anatomically correct, very uh, detailed male sex doll. Just doing one of these. Up. Happy. You know? Happy sex doll. Yeah, very happy. I mean, he was, he was ready to go. <laughs> and so I'm like a brand new <laughs> cop. I see this guy and I'm like, oh, right? I, and I'm like, Jesus Christ. So I'm like sweating, realize it's not a person, put my gun away. And I'm like, we got to get out of here. So we're leaving and we're walking out the door. And on the stoop, this lady's sitting and she's like, oh, is everything okay? And I'm so embarrassed that I just like walk right past her and I walk to my cruiser. Meanwhile, my partner, right, the big guy, he like pulls out a butt. He's like, yeah, everything's okay, but um, we shot the guy in the closet. <laughs> you know, and like <laughs> puts a cigarette and, and, and uh, this girl turns like seven raids, seven raids, seven shades of red and like runs upstairs. Yeah. And like a week later, there's a for rent sign uh, in the window. So who oh knows what God. she was doing, but. So well, I think every, it's pretty clear what she was doing. Yeah, yeah, she had uh, another source of income the IRS didn't know about. So uh -huh. who knows? Ever met anybody <laughs> famous, Matt? Dealings with uh, anybody? Yeah, famous? I have um, a couple times. Yeah, I I, I met a uh, little fella, and I say little fella because we're about the same size. Who um, go, goes by the name of Kix Brooks? And, oh yeah, uh, he pretty cool. Pretty cool guy. He was just a, like a down to earth dude super nice um I, I tried to play it off like super cool but i really wanted to like take my phone out and be like let's take a picture real quick but mm -hmm. like dude I, Boots Good and boogie's an awesome song i love brooks and dunn that's right i want to be i would be like hey man like you're awesome i love you but it would have been weird yeah but he was no i'm sure he was pretty, pretty used to that kicks has a long history with the greater portland area you know his sister and he was here for a long time working for an ad agency and everything if anybody doesn't know that 90 super group country <laughs> superstar brooks and Dunn. um so uh you have a lot of stories to tell uh that uh we're gonna get to through this i want to ask you one more uh about the uh, no name fair game story <laughs> i remember you telling me this story once before uh, right. And uh, and this is something that anyone uh, who has issues with food in the refrigerator in a workplace and someone stealing your lunch. And this is a horrible story that happened to you, but a built in lesson. OK, so th that's a rule. If if you put food in the in the fridge at whatever yeah. agency you're at, it doesn't matter if you're a cop or whatever, you got to put your name on it. Right. So I was a young guy and I was hungry and I went into the fridge and sure enough. There was something in there that didn't have a name on it. Looked good to me. So I mm -hmm. decided I'm going to eat it. Um, and about 10 minutes after eating said item, instantly regretted that. Yeah. And um, it was one of those times where it was like an emergency. I like, I have to get back to the office immediately because my stomach, there was a disturbance in the force. And I was, <laughs> uh, was going to die. So um, yeah, lesson learned. What I ate probably had spoiled. Mm, maybe it tasted yeah. okay. Um, so that's the but, uh, no no name fair game, but probably a bad idea. Yeah, you should probably sniff it first, or uh, the green isn't necessarily guacamole. I mean, uh, one of those. Things. All right, so you were yeah, you were it, desperately hungry. I guess is what you're saying. Desperately I was desperately hungry. hungry. It was the middle of the night. I was I was a midnight cop at the time, and I thought 
eh, I'm going to eat this. Bad idea. Real bad idea. We're going to talk a little bit about this American flag. Yeah. You remember the story? It's how we met. I do. This is coming up right. on the Main People Podcast. Radio207.com only plays original country music from Maine singers, songwriters, and bands. Streaming online and on your smart speaker. Radio207.com is on the air now. Radio207.com. Only Maine, only country music. My dad brought me up was always to work hard Hi, and to treat people well. You ready to go for a ride? We try to keep our goal to make people feel comfortable buying their cars and feel comfortable with the people they're working with. Nice. Oh, it looks good over here. So become part of our family. We really mean that. Without question, we're in this together. We're going to take care of you and treat you like your family anyways. This looks awesome. Yankee Ford has so many people willing to help and make this tough time a little bit easier. Your next online event can be perfect thanks to virtualproductionsgroup.com. The Main People podcast couldn't happen without them, and they can make your remote streaming event absolutely technically perfect. High-quality live and pre-recorded productions for corporate events, weddings, tournaments, charities, and more with virtualproductionsgroup.com. So uh, we're telling stories uh, about police work and about our friendship, how we met, uh, was this flag uh, almost five years ago. Uh, we had had a house fire. Uh, you were working in the area, and this flag made its way, you thought, secretly uh, to my door. That's right. And it wasn't quite so secret because my wife spotted you. Uh, you didn't know anyone, anybody was home. But tell the story behind That's this right. flag, will you? So uh, I listened to you on the air that morning. Uh, I've been a, a huge fan of your uh, morning show for years. Um, grew up with you, in fact. And uh, uh, That's not what I want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Grew up with me is not what I want to hear exactly, but uh, I thank you and the staff and my coworkers at WPOR. Thank you. <laughs> well, it, it it's they've they've been great. Um, so I hear the story and it was it was heartbreaking. You were telling the story about how the flag, um, I believe, it was from your from your dad, correct? Had had mm. had burned in the fire, and uh, it just it struck a chord. I mean, it it was one of those moments where you're driving down the road. And uh, you're choking back tears because it just hits you at home. And, and that's the greatest thing about that morning show is that those folks uh, relate to their listeners and, and tell stories that you feel part of and you feel part of their family. And I had never met you before. I didn't know who you were. I, I knew that you mm -hmm. lived in town, but I didn't know who you were. And um, sitting next to me in my patrol bag was this, this flag that, that, that you're holding that um, one of my best friends and, and college roommate had flown for me during one of his deployments um, overseas. And I carried it with me every day. It, it stayed in my bag next to me. And uh, on Veterans Day, I would put it up on the dashboard or Memorial Day or something to that effect. Um, and uh, the type of guy that he was or he is, uh, I knew that if I had passed that flag along to somebody, he would understand. So I pulled over to the side of the road and I'm choking back tears and I'm writing a note down on uh, my notebook. And uh, I find out where you live and I, I sneak down the road thinking it's the middle of the day. Yep. This guy's on the air. He's not going to see me. And I pull mm. in and as I'm putting the flag down with the little note, out comes your wife. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm busted. And I don't remember if, if we exchanged any words, but uh, I just kind of like waved, I think, and kind of like put it in reverse and got out of Dodge. <laughs> and uh, that's, just, that's just how we met. And it, it's, been, it's been a great friendship ever since. And, yep. uh, you know, that's the important stuff that, 
you, you got to remember as a as a, um, a police officer or a detective or a command staff in your community is those people that are there. That's who you're working for. And those are relationships that you're, you're trying to establish and show that you're not just some guy or girl driving around in a car answering calls. You're actually a person and you, you have emotion. So um, it's, it's important to, to, to be that as a cop as well. Well, I appreciate that. And I know someday I'll, I'll pass this flag along to somebody else, even though, you know, I mean, you did, you did gift it to me as a, as a sign for, you know, what I had, uh, had lost part of uh, since with our house fire, my biological dad was a Marine and had just, you know, a few years before uh, had died. And this was, that was the flag from, uh, from was draped over his coffin. So, uh, you know, I appreciate your gesture and I'll pass that along to somebody, but yeah, I mean, you talk about being a police officer and, you know, as a police detective here in Southern Maine, I'm sure you've had some more difficult cases too, to get serious for a moment. Yeah, there, there are definitely ones, um, you know, that keep you up at night or you, when you get home and, and you realize that you, you can't get to the conclusion that you want to, those are tough. And you have to try to remember that you can't solve them all. You'd like to, but you can't. And that's the difficult part. Um, we, we had one a few years back where a, um, a person had gone missing and all the signs had pointed to that uh, they potentially taken their own life. And the, the family was really struggling with that. And fast forward a couple of years, we were able to uh, recover the remains of, of, of that missing person. Hmm. And it, it was hard because in that time frame, in that gap between they don't know where they are until we, we find those remains, um, you know, you, your heart breaks for them and you grieve with them because you can't solve that case, right? Nobody calls Certainly not in 60 minutes. When, like we're all used to TV shows and it doesn't right. all wrap up in 60 minutes. That's right. No, you, you, can't, you can't solve the case that quickly, right? And you're used to people calling the police, you know, when they have a problem and you're the problem solver and you're supposed to be able to find the answers. And when you can't, it's tough. So that's, that's the hard part of, of police work is not being able to find all the answers all the time. In New England, uh, the Whitey Bulger gang is legendary. Um, you have uh, what I think is probably one of the most unique stories uh, from a town in Southern Maine that you can name if you choose to name yeah. it, but had no idea that a member of the Whitey Bulger gang found themselves here quite by mistake. Well, yeah, exactly. So uh, I'll take you back in time again. It was the day after St. Patrick's Day. And this won't shock you for being a Whitey Bulger guy. Um, and it's it's early in the morning, uh, probably four four thirty, if I remember correctly. And uh, I was working patrol at the time, and and we got a call to a gas station for a, uh, a fellow that that was lateral in between the two, you know, the islands of the, of the gas station, you know. And we get how, there. How, how do you get like that? Guy, ah, well, I, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um, it, too too many Guinnesses, maybe. I, I don't yeah. Know. So uh, anyway, this cat is um, pretty well impaired, and uh, we, we take him into custody. And during the booking process, he's telling, oh, I know Whitey, I know I'm from Southie. The whole time, he thought he was in South Boston. He's in Southern Maine. Yeah, like, that's pretty far explain, away. But it's pretty far away, like not for nothing, but you took a wrong turn on Tobin. I don't know what to tell you, but the, you're in Maine. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> I mean, right? Like for real. I mean, when traffic got really thin, he should have been like, nah, I'm not, I don't think I'm at home anymore. But at any rate, uh -huh. so we lock him up and uh, the whole time he's like, I know Whitey, I was in the gang. We're like, yeah, okay, whatever. Like, sure you were. Okay. And uh, sure as the day is long though, I'm like Googling him. I'm like, huh, he was. Uh, he was just a small time <laughs> player back in the day, but sure, sure shit. He was in the Winter Hill gang. And uh, here he was in, in Southern Maine, um, hammered out of his tree on, on uh, yeah. St. Patty's Day. So. Yeah. It, was, it was pretty and great. Made it home the next day safe, you assume? Yeah. Well, no, his his daughter came and bailed him out. Oh. So off he went. All right. Uh, <laughs> right? I'm going to ask you the story in a minute, a very serious story about a bag of rubber dicks that you, <laughs> that yeah. you found. Words I yeah. never thought I would say. <laughs> that, and we'll talk a yeah. little bit of music uh, and about uh, you representing some uh, veterans here in Southern Maine, too. Uh, all coming up on the Main People Podcast. The way my dad brought me up was always to work hard Hi, and to treat people well. You ready to go for 
ride. We try to keep our goal to make people feel comfortable buying their cars and feel comfortable with the people they're working with. Nice. Oh, it looks good over here. So become part of our family. We really mean that. Without question, we're in this together. We're going to take care of you and treat you like your family anyways. Yankee Ford has so many people willing to help and make this tough time a little bit easier. Radio207.com only plays original country music from main singers, songwriters, and bands. Streaming online and on your smart speaker. Radio207.com is on the air now. Radio207.com. Only main, only country music. Matt, we've talked a couple times. I've teased the uh, the bag of goodies that you found, goodies to somebody. Uh, one of the, you know, you deal with a lot of rough stories. Yours is a dangerous job. You do a lot of detail work as a detective here for an unnamed Southern Maine uh, town. But uh, there are also some stories that I'm sure you can tell, like this one, and you know the one I'm talking about, that uh, are good for laughs. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, this is a great story. So... Um... It, well, it, it's a hot topic now, but cruiser cams and body camera footage and, and things like that. So when that was first coming out, the technology obviously wasn't what it is now. And so we only had a dash camera, okay? And then you had to wear this microphone like in your pocket and like up through your shirt and everything else. And when both of those were on and you got back in the car, you'd get that feedback, right? It would, that that mm -hmm. tone would play. So... This is new, new software, new stuff we're using. I stopped this car. I arrest this young lady. I put her in my car. And then I was searching her car as to the, before the tow truck was coming. And it was me and my partner. And we're searching the car. And there's this big, like, hockey bag, if you will, right there. So we open it <laughs> Okay, up. that's a large bag. That's, that's a large bag. Okay, it's a large bag. Yeah. I mean, there could have been a body. It could have been a bunch of money. I don't know. It could have been guns. I don't know. So I open it. Sure as the day is long, it's a bunch of rubber dicks. Uh, apparently she was, uh, one of those, you know, those adult party planners, if you will. Right. So I'm right. a young cop. He's a young cop. I'm like, Oh, look at this. I'm like smacking him with it. You know, pulling these <laughs> things out. I'm like, look at this one. But we're, we're talking about these rubber dicks. I mean, like some are little, some are big, some are like this. Big. I'm like, Holy shit. Look at this one. And we're like smacking each other and shit. So, uh, we have our little fun. We zip everything back up the bag. We zip the bag up and yes. okay. I go back <laughs> in the car. Just so we're to clear. Stop you. Yeah. Well, this, the statute of limitations has passed, so I can't get in trouble for it. <laughs> right. Anyway, anyway, so uh, I get back in the car, and as soon as I get back in the car, I get that feedback between the mics, and that mm -hmm. loud, like, beep, you know, tone goes off. And she's sitting in the back seat, and she's like, Did you find anything you like? I was just like, fuck, oh, Jesus. I'm like, uh, oh, nope. And she heard the whole up. thing. Heard the whole thing. She heard verbatim everything that mm -hmm. was said. So I like reach up, touch the, you know, turn the, turn the camera off. I'm like, oh God. So I'm, you know, driving into booking. And when I get to the uh, portion where you ask what they do for a living, I just didn't want to ask it. I just didn't want to know. Mm -hmm. and, and she had been, you know, in the game a little while. So she knew, and she's like, I'm an adult party planner. I was like, got it. No problem. Party planner. But, party planner. <laughs> yep. Yep. So that's what I wrote. I wrote party planner. So, uh, well, I mean, she must have been good. I mean, there's a whole bag of them. So I, uh -huh. I don't, I don't know. I've never been to one, but. Or maybe she was not was. good because she hadn't sold any of them. Well, also true. Also true. Maybe you think about it that way. It's a good point. Let's talk about music for a second. Cause great point. I, I play music for a living on the radio. As you know, um, what, if you had one choice going to a, if you were stranded on a desert Island, let's say, and you had one choice, one album for all time that you could listen to. And that's the only one you had. What would it be? Oh, geez. Um, wow, it's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know what? I would say um, Tim McGraw's greatest hits, probably circa 2000, somewhere around there. Um, yeah. It, I, don't, I don't know. It was just, uh, it was so about that the first time greatest that I, hits with yeah. Just to See You Smile yeah, yeah. and something like that and yes. Where the Green Grass Grows. Yeah. That's yeah. right. You Good know, choice. it was kind of like, it was it was it was great country music. Uh, they all told a story. Um, I've got a personal connection with that that 
album and it just brings me back in time to a, to a great time in my life. And I think if I was mm-hmm. straight on Allen, that's you want to remember the good times, right? So that's the one I would. Yeah, pick. it's funny you mentioned that one because we were just talking on the air a week or so ago uh, that Tim McGraw's Everywhere album was is one of the best country albums of all time. Oh, and for sure. And Tim McGraw, you know, that's, I mean, a, that's, a, super th- that's a third of that greatest hits. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, ways that you've represented the state. Um, I didn't know until recently you happened to casually mention that you went with the caravan, the wreaths of America caravan to Arlington national cemetery. What kind of yep. impact did that have on you laying those wreaths on all those soldiers graves? Um, so th- that's, a, that's a really cool opportunity. And if, if you've got an opportunity, anybody out there is listening that has an opportunity to do that, whether it's one day or two days, a full thing, it, it, um, it, it'll, it'll humble you. You see these people, you get up early and you start driving um, down Route 1 in Maine. And you're seeing these people in these small towns and it's freezing and they're out there and they're waving flags. And you meet people along the way who are Gold Star families and they've lost somebody. And it might be a trucker that's in the convoy whose family member is uh, buried. And it, uh, it holds a special place in your heart. Uh, this year, my father-in-law went with me on a day and, um, you know, he's a veteran and we were at one of the stops and he ended up meeting a guy, uh, who was on a sister ship with him in port in 1980 in Italy, you know, you know what I mean? And they hadn't wow. seen each other since, right? 41 yeah. years that they hadn't seen each other. Um, and you, you watch these veterans, um, talk about it and it's, it's, it's important. It's, it's great. If you have the opportunity, you should do it. Hmm. When you, uh, when you first started on the force, you were not married, right? That's correct. Yep. Getting married, having kids, has it changed the way you look at your job any? Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you, when I was single, uh, you know, I was young and, you know, you, you think you're six feet tall and bulletproof, right? Um, nothing bothers you. You can do it. But then, um, you know, when you get, <clears throat> when you get, um, you get married and you have kids and I get little girls and, um, I don't, it's it's tough, you know, when when you walk out the that, door and they're like, oh, "I love you, Dad." It's hard. It doesn't change for anything, any aspect. You don't have to be a police officer to have that exact same answer, though. I guess, do you? No, I think I think it's any job um, nowadays. You know, there's uh, there's some folks out there that that kind of give police a bad name, so it's in the news a little bit. And my mm-hmm. oldest daughter is old enough to kind of like wrap her head around it a little bit, so um, you know that hits home. Uh, and then, you know, my youngest, you know, she's little and, and uh, you know, she might give you a sticker and you, you put it on the back of your shield or something. And it just means it means more. Uh, it, it means more. You know, you know that you're, you're living for, for them and they want you to come home. So, uh, yeah. You think, you'd be, uh, you think you'd be a different police officer if you didn't live in the state of Maine, if you lived in somewhere like Boston? Or do you think you'd be the same person? Yeah, How much did Maine affect yeah. you? Well, you know, be, being from Maine and uh, and working here, and born and raised here, is uh, you learn you learn the culture and you learn the people and how much that they love their communities and how they understand how things work. You go to a big city, you've got people from everywhere. You've got a mixed bag of of people from different cultures, and sometimes that's difficult because they don't understand the way things might work depending mm-hmm. on where they're from in the country or the world. So. Maine's a great place. A lot of people knock it, but but uh, it's a great place to be. It's a great place to work, and I, I wouldn't have traded for anything. I'm almost done my career, so I wouldn't have traded for anything. Maine is one of the few places, I think, where if you accidentally dug up an Indian burial ground, you would just gather the bones and walk away. True story? Yeah, well, th- that is a true story. Uh, <laughs> so years ago, they were doing a, a, a major construction project, and as they were doing that, they dug up these bones, right? And so... So these guys all of a sudden think that they've, they stumble on this like homicide or something. So, right, the world stops. Everybody comes. There's cops everywhere, news crews, the whole deal. And um, sure enough, they, they're like, yeah, these are just like Indian bones. They're like hundreds of years old. So whatever. And it was just very non-ceremoniously. They were just like, okay. They picked these bones up, put them in a bag, and drove away, and they just kept working. And that's it. So that, what kind of construction project? Were they building a house there uh, or something? Uh, they were expanding a road into an industrial park, so they just okay. kept going. Is it, isn't that hey, isn't that the it, whole? It's a curse. That's poltergeist, right? Isn't that the whole thing? They built a housing development hey, on the it. Indian burial ground. 
You're right? all gonna I was, die. I was, that's right. I was sitting in the car. I had nothing to do with it, so I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> There's nobody coming through Matt, my thanks, TV, so I'm good. Thanks. So, <laughs> except us, just now. Um, that's right. Thanks for being on. Uh, the main people podcast really appreciate you so much appreciate your uh, your friendship appreciate everything you do every day as a police detective here in southern maine and thanks for being on the podcast all right thank you cheers guys did you know the most famous worm in the world comes from westbrook maine it's true scott garland formerly known as scotty too hotty maine's most famous wrestler coming up in the next main people podcast